Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I see Dr. Tharoor has joined us. Welcome, Dr. Tharoor. Thank you. Good to be with you. Thank you. Uh, although you need no introduction, but let me do my duty and uh, uh, share my thoughts with the people here before I hand over to Mr. Sanjay Kiloska, the president of IMA. Uh, Dr. Tharoor, a formal international diplomat, writer, and a prominent politician, really needs no introduction, as I said. He's erudite and articulate, and he brings intellectual flair to public debates. He's a member of Lok Sabha since 2009, and he was minister in the second Manmohan Singh government. He's a former Under Secretary General of the United Nations, an avid writer of fiction, history, and geopolitics. He's a best selling author. He's also known for discovering and popularizing quaint English words, to put it mildly. So, with these few words, let me hand over to Mr. Kiroski. <laughs> Okay, I hope I'm audible. Uh, yes, Dr. you are. Dr. Tharoor, uh, Ms. Rekha Sethi, ladies and gentlemen. It's really nice to see you again, Dr. Tharoor. It's been a long time since we last met. In fact, I believe the last time was... Good to see you, on. Sanjay. I'm afraid I'm having some audio difficulties. I hope that this will improve as evening wears on. Okay. I think uh, the last time we met was at the Indira Gandhi International Airport when you were rushing to catch a flight. That's right. Driving during uh, the pandemic is going to be very difficult, I guess. And I really don't know when Pratima is going to allow me to leave town. And <laughs> as we all know, the world has been in the grip of this lethal virus for more than five months now. And nobody seems to have a way to uh, found a way to neutralize it yet. COVID-19 has already killed almost 400,000 people, more than 400,000 people worldwide, including nearly 7,750 in India. Nearly 7.4 million people have been infected and the virus continues to spread across the world. The global economy has been devastated. Most expect global output to shrink by more than 5% in 2020 from the 3% growth that was expected just in January, five months ago. Uh, many sectors, I believe, would see bankruptcies and job losses, possibly aviation, realty, tourism, hospitality, retail, and maybe export dependent manufacturing. Most banks and analysts also expect our economy to shrink in the current fiscal year. Even the State Bank of India expects a contraction. All these projections were made before the fourth lock installment of the lockdown was in announced. And I think it's after what everyone says, it's after 40 years that India's economy is going to shrink. And globally, so much has changed over the last few years. For one, after becoming US president in early 2017, Donald Trump has proceeded to follow his America First program, tearing up old agreements, whether connected to arms limitation or global warming, and almost ripping apart the 75-year-old alliance with Western Europe. In fact, most countries probably do not consider the US to be a reliable partner anymore. On the other hand, we see the inevitable rise of China. I remember reading a book authored by the Singaporean diplomat Kishore Mehbubani called The New Asian Hemisphere, The Irresistible Shift of Global Power to the East. In it, he mentions the five-point program drawn up by Deng Xiaoping, who was the paramount leader of China from 1978 until his retirement in 1992. I believe he was the first communist leader of China to actually have his own, I mean, plan his own retirement. Uh, before that, they usually died or were pushed aside. His successors actually seem to have followed that plan perfectly. And President Xi is just following the last step. Re Russia under Putin seems to have come back once again to becoming a great power, while Europe and Britain seem to be rudderless. So where does that leave us? with one of the largest populations in the world and the world's fifth largest economy, we should have been in a good situation. However, even before the virus hit, our economy was shaky. Private investment and consumption were already falling. 
Now the job of India's policymakers has become even more challenging. And at the same time, China seems to be very active on our northern borders. And not only our border, but the entire South China Sea. So as the audience knows, Dr. Tarur is a prolific writer, but I'm not sure how many people know that he began writing at the age of six. And his first published story appeared in the Free Press Journal in Mumbai when he was 10. I've read that his adventure novel of Operation Bellows was serialized in the junior statesman just before his 11th birthday. As Rekha mentioned, many people make fun of you for your part of the English language, but I do- Sorry, sorry, that... I didn't say fun of him. I didn't say fun of him, <laughs> make fun of him. Then. Let me say that. <laughs> he's, a fellow, I'm on WhatsApp. he's a fellow Stephanian, I'd never do that. <laughs> okay. For, for your command of the English language. But I believe that each of your books has been a bestseller. So people do love reading them. And in fact, I understand that you have now co-authored a new book uh, called The New World Disorder and the Indian Imperative. So really, you're the go-to person on this subject. Before returning to India, you served as uh, Under Secretary General at the United Nations. You have a PhD in international relations from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. In any case, so much has changed in the past few years and so much more is going to change in the near future. With your background about world affairs and knowledge about global as well as Indian history, we are all interested in hearing your views on India's options in the post-COVID world order. So uh, I, it's over to you now. And uh, after you speak, we will have a question and answer session. Dr. Tharoor. Thank you, uh, Sanjay. I'm sorry to say that I seem to have a terrible internet connection today, partially because of a rainstorm in Delhi. So I, I would simply tell the organizers that if my sound becomes unstable, you might just want to turn off the video uh, and just hear me because I, I am afraid I only got about 25% of what you said, Sanjay, and I missed all the kind words about me that you seem to be expressing. I could catch little fragments of syllables. I'm gonna ask you later what kind things you had to say. I'm assuming they were kind. Yes, Knowing you, I'm sure they were. <laughs> um, but, uh, but it's very good to see you and, and uh, I agree with you, it'll be a long time before we are likely to run into each other in an airport again, uh, the way things are looking, uh, certainly, Heading to Delhi Airport now seems a perilous undertaking as every second person in the city seems to be coming down the virus. And um, we can look beyond our immediate confines to the broader geopolitical picture, uh, which is what I understand you all wanted me to address. Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll take about 10 minutes or a little more and talk about the broader picture. And we can go into specifics during the Q&A, depending on what's on people's minds. Uh, though it's too, it seems increasingly likely that COVID-19 will inaugurate an era of what's being called deglobalization. The signs are mounting that the world may embrace isolationism and protectionism in a far more enthusiastic way than prior to the outbreak, including in India. We've already seen a number of indications of this. The pandemic has confirmed for many that in times of crisis, people rely on their governments to shield them. That global supply chains are vulnerable. Uh, Rekha, it might be better to shut off uh, Dr. Tharoor's video.
Can you hear me now again? Yeah, maybe you'd Hello. like to switch off your video. It might be better. Yeah, I think right now this, the picture seems clearer. So I'm, I'm going to try. I'm okay. happy to switch off the video, but in case people want to look at the face, we'll try. And if it if it seems to be getting bad, I'll turn it off, turn off the video. Um, sure. Okay. Uh, so as I, was, I don't know how much you were able to hear. Um, I was saying that the pandemic has confirmed how much people rely on their governments uh, to shield them, that uh, global supply chains are vulnerable to disruption and are therefore unsustainable. We saw this, as you know, with uh, uh, when, when China first had a shutdown, we suddenly found that um, that a number of items that we manufactured in India, we couldn't complete manufacturing because indispensable parts came from there. The dependence on foreign countries for essential goods, such as pharmaceuticals, or even the ingredients that go into making our pharmaceuticals, uh, which in many cases come from China, uh, could be fatal. For example, many of you may be having brufen. Apparently, we import the, the, the crucial chemical uh, uh, precursors to make our ibuprofen in India entirely from China. And now nations need to acquire medicines and supplies for their own people at the expense of each other. There's a rush to reset global supply chains and raise trade barriers and the demand for more protectionism and self-reliance, which has been echoed in Mr. Modi's call for uh, Atma Nirbharta, for bringing manufacturing and production value chains back home or at least closer to home is mounting across the world. And this is undoubtedly going to uh, make things very difficult for us. I think Make in India was already facing a very uphill struggle, but now more and more things are going to be made at home in by many developed countries rather than abroad. Uh, along with the global flow of capital and investments, multi-border pipelines, energy grids, international travel across free and open borders, all of these have become very vulnerable in the post-COVID era. The world economy had thrived since globalization began in 1980 on an open system of, of free trade. Now this had already been shaken by the financial crash of 2008-09 in the Western world and then the American trade war with China under Trump. With the coronavirus, exports are falling everywhere. I, I think Sanjay may have mentioned this, but indications are that world goods trade will shrink by at least 30% this year, if not more. Meanwhile, the increasing pressure to decouple from China is mounting. So Japan, for instance, has set aside two and a quarter billion dollars in incentives for Japanese companies to pull out of that country. Now that in turn will mean that without inexpensive Chinese labor and subsidized inputs, the era of cheap globalized goods, including for Indian consumers, may even be over. COVID-19, of course, has also convinced many that foreigners are to be feared, that strict border and immigration controls are essential, that countries cannot always use, expect useful help from their neighbors and allies, and that national interests should trump international cooperation. To many, including those around Mr. Modi, the answer seems to lie in strong government, in putting the nation's needs over individual citizens' freedoms, and in dispensing with democratic niceties, from federalism to parliamentary oversight in whatever the government deems to be the national interest. Now, these are things we've seen directly in our own country. We've seen the way in which the, the NDMA, the National Disaster Management Act, was invoked to ride roughshod over federalism. The way in which when, for example, my state of Kerala, which had flattened the curve quite early, wanted to liberalize uh, lockdown restrictions in certain districts that were virus free, there was a, an immediate stricture from the Home Secretary in Delhi saying nothing doing, you can't deviate beyond what we in the center authorize you to. This is all a, a dramatic inversion of some of our constitutional ideas. A parliamentary oversight, parliament has simply not met and the parliamentary committees have not been allowed to meet. So we have had some real challenges in actually achieving any parliamentary oversight. Uh, those of us who had also begun to imagine the globe as one world all this Vasudeva Kutumbakam business will have to revise our thinking because support for nationalist strongmen, many of whom have used the present crisis to shore up their authority and power, is likely to increase exponentially. Already, this pandemic period seems to have ushered in an increasing 
an increased fear of the other, uh, with a capital O, as, as, as unfounded rumors and accusations against people blamed on the basis of their national, religious, ethnic, or regional identity have had a field day in many countries. In India, we know that citizens from our Northeastern states have suffered racial discrimination because of their supposedly Chinese features, just as Chinese have had incidents of being thrown out of Western supermarkets, as many of us have seen the clips on our WhatsApp feeds. Social media and nativist populism have amplified prejudices. So the fact that a Puritan Muslim sect, the Tablighi Jamaat, had held a major gathering just before the lockdown, whose attendees spread the infection to many states <coughs> when they returned home, was used to justify open bigotry and discrimination against Muslims. The atmosphere created by the virus has empowered those who seek to spread another contagion, that of communal hatred and bigotry. Now, there's no doubt that the COVID uh, pandemic was a mega shock to the global system that is likely to disrupt the existing world order. Sanjay has alluded to that, I believe, as sovereignties are reasserted across the world and treaties and trade agreements are increasingly questioned. Multilateralism could be the next casualty. President Trump's announcement that he was withdrawing the US from the World Health Organization may be a harbinger of a greater unraveling to follow of the international system so painfully and painstakingly constructed after World War II. Instead of strengthening the capacity of our global institutions to cope with the future crisis, the world's reaction to the virus may well end up destroying the most fundamental feature it has exposed, the idea of our common humanity. Now with the, this disruption to our lives uh, and, and, and I think the likelihood that these effects are gonna persist, even when the severity of the, of the actual virus diminishes, uh, we can truly look at differences uh, in a number of areas affecting India. Domestically, I think our politics are certainly uh, going to witness uh, certainly increased uh, authoritarian tendencies. There's real fear of the rise of the surveillance state with the uh, introduction and making compulsory in many places of the Arogya Setu app. Happy to talk about that if anyone's interested. Um, but there are also some positives. I hope there will be a much more greater awareness of the need for a new priority in public health spending. We've only spent 1.28% of our GDP on public health in the last fiscal year. Uh, and, and clearly we need much more and also much more preventive. The sight of the nation's capital being in a position where people are desperately going from hospital to hospital. Yesterday, there was a horror story when a woman was turned away from nine hospitals and died before they could reach a 10th one. This is a shameful reminder of how woeful is and how inadequate is our public health infrastructure. We've also, I think, developed an awareness of the migrant workers and how much we depend on them in our economy. That's something which people had taken for granted and not realized. Suddenly the drama of their suffering, their fruitless and painful and often casualty ridden trudge home has also opened the eyes of many affluent Indians. Uh, the internet, I'm sorry we lost the connection a few minutes ago. That's something else we really will have to focus on. One of the questions I will have when they allow my committee, the Committee on Information Technology to meet in parliament is what are we going to do to increase our broadband performance? We are currently 92nd out of 120 countries measured in the world in terms of the speed and range of our broadband. Why do we have to be so far behind? We boast of being the second, third, fourth largest economy in the world. Third actually now in, in, in purchasing power parity terms. We should have a far better internet and the, the, when we've all had to work virtually, we've realized how poor our broadband connections are in many parts of our country. And we've also frankly had a chance to discover how much better other, even other developing countries like next door Bangladesh are when it comes to internet connections by comparison with us. And I hope that we can all allocate more spectrum to civilian purposes. The government of India keeps the world record percentage of spectrum reserved for itself rather than for the public. If we can open up some more percentages of spectrum uh, and, and, and once we move to 5G and so on, we may really be able to do much more work virtually and even change, for example, the pattern of urbanization in our country. I would love to see us fulfilling 
President Abdul Kalam's famous dream of providing urban facilities in rural areas. And if you're doing a job that requires mainly the internet, if you are doing business process offshoring for companies abroad, you don't really need to sit in a congested urban city. You don't need to be in Gurgaon or Mumbai or Bangalore. Why can't you be sitting in a village with a good broadband connection, reliable electricity, and dealing with the world? Here are all possibilities that we will have undoubtedly also for us in India. Uh, E-learning, I think, is still going to have major challenges in India, but that's another domain for which expansion ought to be possible if we get the infrastructure right. Now, we know that our economy is coming out ravaged. I think Sanjay was alluding to that. Uh, investors are certainly not heading our way. They're scared off for many reasons. Unemployment is spiking now. Our public debt is skyrocketing. Uh, and, and many are going back to their own, own economies and concentrating there. Uh, the IMF says that 170 countries are going to experience negative per capita income growth. Uh, so that's going to be something bad. We'll be pushing people below the poverty line for the first time in 25, 30 years. And that is going to be a real problem because uh, since 1990, India's story has been a steady one of pulling about an average of 10 million people every year above the poverty line. We're going to be reversing that. So that's something else we're going to have to worry about. This could give an impetus to radical reform, but it could go the other way. And I must say that I, I have very little faith, uh, and I'm not saying this purely as an opposition MP, but as somebody who has in the past applauded some of the prime minister's statements, which sadly he seemed uh, actually uninterested in fulfilling. When he says things like the government has no business to be in business, but for six years hasn't lifted a finger to get the government out of any business. And he sets privatization targets, but the only privatization he's done is to switch a holdings of government public sector units from one public sector company to another. Uh, when he talks about land reform, labor law, law reform, regulatory reform, ease of doing business, uh, but outside a few limited sectors measured in Mumbai and Delhi, uh, ease of doing business is hampered by one of the biggest regulatory compliance burdens in the world. And we've seen examples of the way in which our bureaucracy relishes writing incomprehensible and impenetrable regulations during COVID. We've seen these circulars coming out one after the other, full of contradictions, new corrections being issued, contradicting the previous ones, confusion between center and state about how to implement them. Uh, that is not an encouraging climate to bring in more foreign uh, investment. Uh, I would finally conclude by saying, I think if we want to recover from all of this, uh, we, we would need, I think, to actually make a serious effort to get uh, a, a task force together, neither full of bureaucrats, nor even just of economic experts, but of people like you in the All India Management Association, people running real businesses, to tell the government what you need, what are the regulations you want lifted? What are the things you want eased up? If the government wants to see change and progress, it can only come through people like you. Um, and on the, the geopolitics of China, sorry, that's something Sanjay mentioned that I didn't address. I think at the moment, Sanjay, it can go both ways. Uh, there, there is both, as I mentioned, an effort to decouple from China. I gave you the Japan example, but Australia, the US, others are talking about decoupling. And there's also a greater assertiveness by China because China has the money and China is the first economy to have recovered uh, rapidly after the, in fact, I, I, I was at a presentation for uh, international parliamentarians yesterday in which a Chinese establishment voice, a spokesman, a, pro a professor said that 80% uh, of the pre-COVID GDP is already been attained and they will get back to 100% in a couple of months. Uh, so they will use checkbook diplomacy, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, their reputation for efficiently handling COVID and so on um, to strategically position themselves as a guarantor of global public goods. And this will give them some, some influence in the world at a time when the rest of the world, including India, is still grappling with the pandemic, which is why I think they made their move in Ladakh. I think they, they knew that we were on a back foot. The government had too much that it was already floundering in dealing with, and they could essentially assert themselves. So um, if I had to choose between the two, I think the decoupling from China is less likely to succeed than uh, Chinese assertion uh, actually actually making significant progress. But we can explore that further as well in the Q&A because I've used up my 10 or 12 minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Sanjay. 
Thank you. I think you were audible for most of the time, other than the uh, small thing, the small problem that we had. In fact, one of the people said only the internet and technology seems to have left you tongue-tied while you were <laughs> not available. But since we uh, ended, I mean, since you ended with China, there are two questions which are related to China. One is from uh, Dr. Ani Sansari, uh, and he says, in case the U.S. launches offensive against China, will India align with the West? And if so, will it hurt India? That is one question about China. And Mr. Jibu Paul, who is from Kochi, uh, he says, uh, president of Kochi Management Association, he says, sir, do you think India's bargaining power with China and US will grow in the post-COVID world? Right. Well, I, I must say, neither question is easy to answer. So thanks. You guys are living up to your formidable reputations for, uh, for, for being tough, tough thinkers. Um, on the first one, I would say that uh, India should not, this is my strong advocacy, should not put all its eggs in any basket. But there is definitely a choice that will have to be made because I think if Trump is re-elected in November, we are heading certainly for bristling hostility and possibly a new Cold War between the US and China. It will not be a replica of the old Cold War because uh, uh, one of the things that marked the US-Russian Cold War, Soviet Cold War, was the complete absence of any viable contact between the two countries, uh, other than diplomatic, political, and spies. Um, they had no investment uh, with each other, whereas the exact opposite is true with China. The US is by far the largest investor in China, and China is by far the largest owner of American treasury securities. So there is a mutual dependence, and I think that's going to uh, limit how much damage this might do. But they will certainly be in a Trump-led US uh, more active efforts to circumscribe and contain China. And the US will make it very clear to India that either you play along with us and you are part of this game or don't expect anything from us. That's a very transactional attitude. I think if Biden wins, we'll have an easier time in being able to maintain a certain level of strategic autonomy. Uh, but I think if, if, uh, if Trump wins, the trends that we are seeing so far are irreversibly heading in that particular direction. Uh, and I think that's something which um, uh, may oblige us to make a choice, which in the short term will hurt us because uh, Trump's US is not likely to be a terribly reliable ally in the sense that if, for example, uh, the Chinese uh, decide that we have chosen sides and we've ganged up with the US to contain them and are trying to support US adventures or misadventures in the South China Sea or, or, or actions at the United Nations or the international forums, that the Chinese will see as anti-Chinese, I think they could really double down on what they're doing in Ladakh, what they haven't renewed in Arunachal Pradesh, but they have uh, officially maintained they easily end up in a position where we are very, very much off balance vis-a-vis -vis China. So it's going to call for very adroit diplomacy. I have to say that I personally have a lot of regard for uh, Foreign Minister Jay Shankar, who was Foreign Secretary. I have somewhat less regard for his political masters, uh, uh, he's, not, he's not essentially a politician, he's trained in the foreign service. Uh, but I think it's going to be a very, very complicated and sensitive uh, issue to settle. That's why I'm not going to give, I think Mr. Ansari was the name, a, a very clear uh, one side answer other than laying out these parameters as inevitable. Now, please remind me of the second question. I went on too long on the first. Uh, the second question was from your part of the country, Mr. Jibu Paul. Kuchi from Jibu Paul, yeah. He says, do you think India's bargaining power with China and the U.S. will grow in the post-COVID world? Now, I, I, for the reasons I mentioned, Jibu Paul, I think it's actually going to be uh, less rather than more uh, because of the problems that I've just explained to you. I think that the, uh, a lot will depend on, on uh, the November election in the U.S. I would say that a Biden administration with very comfortable, familiar American establishment at work uh, will be will be easier to deal with, and they would possibly make it easier for us to navigate. Where we will give them, um, you know, some uh, pleasant noises about the largest democracy and oldest democracy, and 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 work with them on 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 a number of areas, while at the same time trying to keep lines open to the to China. With Trump, it's going to be tougher. For example, what happens if Trump tells us, uh, no, in, we we insist that India uh, disqualify Huawei from bidding for the five G contract, for example. Uh, uh, I mean, I would imagine that uh, India 
will run objective tests. I know that Huawei is one of the companies that's allowed to participate in those tests. And on the basis of objective parameters of technical feasibility, availability, cost, capital investment, et cetera, et cetera, that a formal recommendation will be made to the government by the ministries concerned on technical grounds. That's what happened with the, the Rafal deal, for example. There was political pressure from the US for US aircraft, various technical specifications pointed to Rafal and the government went with that choice. Will we have the same thing here? Uh, in which case, what happens if the technical specifications are seen as most favoring Huawei? Um, I, I, I really do wonder about this government's ability to stand up to a Trump saying, sorry, we have to do what's best for our own people and then live with some of the consequences which may ensue. So in those circumstances, I'll have to say to Jubu Paul that I don't think that we are looking at an increased bargaining power, but rather a much more difficult tightrope act for the government of India. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Vivek Varshne. He says, the Epidemic Act of 1893 has never been discussed in parliament. Any insight would help. So now it's more uh, questions related to India. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the Epidemic Act is massively old fashioned. Uh, it also has provisions that have certainly been honored in the breach, for example, uh, that you can't actually have a gathering of more than 20 people um, anywhere, but, you know, go out in the streets of, go to Marine Drive in Mumbai on the morning of, uh, and see people walking or, or go to, uh, go to uh, any market in Delhi today. I'm afraid the Epidemic Act is not really being enforced. What we have enforced, or what the government has invoked is probably the right way to put it, is a National Disaster Management Act of 2005, which in fact the government had ignored. Um, uh, none of the states have fulfilled any of the provisions of that act in terms of coming up with uh, a national disaster management plan at the center and state disaster management plans at the states. But because the disaster management plan can be read, I'm sorry, disaster management act can be read as giving extraordinary powers to the central government, which did not exist in the 1893 epidemic act because we didn't have the kind of political structure we have today. That's the act that the government has relied upon. I definitely would agree with the implicit question suggesting that we should actually uh, come up with a totally new act to deal with future pandemics and with the world's increase in zoonotic diseases, with SARS, MERS, and now, and now COVID, I think we may as well create an act that will equip us better to deal with the next one. Thank you. The next question is from uh, Mr. Srinivas Dempo from Goa. He says, uh, somehow the lockdown has not been able to control infection if very effectively. What is your opinion on opening up the economy at a faster pace to balance lives versus livelihoods? Well, uh, this is a very important question. And in fact, I, I, as chairman of the All India Professionals Congress, I led a, a dialogue with Kiran Mazumdar Shaw on this very issue, which you, you Folks are welcome to watch. It's on YouTube and I've tweeted links. Um, but, but I would say that it's very clear that we're going to need, uh, actually, um, we're going to need, uh, if you don't mind, the speaker of the Lok Sabha is calling. I'll just tell his staff and I'll call him back. Namaskar. Uh, you're still on mute. Yeah, I'm back. <laughs> so uh, it's just that uh, it's just that uh, I'm I'm engaged in a bit of a battle with the parliamentary authorities to get my parliamentary committee meeting in some shape or form. But there seems to be tremendous resistance to using any of the modern technology that we in India so proudly, uh, you know, thump our chests about globally when it comes to actually anything involving oversight of the government or accountability of the government part of. But that's a different argument, and I, I will catch the speaker, God willing, um, after our, our seminar is over, our webinar is over. Um, so that's 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 broadly the thing that I think we, we really will have to. Um, uh, sorry, where was I when? Can I, can I repeat the question? Uh, it's no, from Srinivas uh, yes, about the lockdown from being able to control, yeah, the uh, infection very effectively. And what is your opinion yeah, on the, and the economy the, of the the economy. balance rates versus well, We like really this. have to head, we really have to head towards a targeted lockdown model. Um, you see, the lockdown concept was only advanced in order to prepare 
uh, other arrangements. The Chinese are the ones who first implemented it very effectively in Wuhan, where they actually physically confined the virus to that one city and within that city to those people who had caught it. They were so ruthless in preventing. I mean, the virus is an opportunistic seeker of a host. It needs a live, uninfected human body for itself to survive. So it, it jumps from one infected person to another uh, in order to seek a host for its own survival and propagation. So if the lockdown had prevented any human being with the virus from contacting any human being without the virus, it would have been forced to die out. Unfortunately, in our country's reality, that was not very realistic. It didn't work. But the, the time could have been bought for certain preparations, including preparing a far better public health infrastructure than, for example, we seem to have done in Delhi, uh, all of that. But it could not have been an indefinite solution. There is no country in the world that has remained locked down indefinitely. Every country, after a while, has uh, said that the lockdown has begun uh, changing the pattern, has witnessed a downfall or a flattening of the curve, and then opened up the economy. India is in an invidious position where we are actually the only country which is in the process of unlocking while the numbers are going up still. So we haven't even reached the peak yet. Every single day for the last three weeks, the number of infected cases has increased the previous day's number. And every single day, the number of deaths has, infect, has, incre has, has been an increase on the previous number of deaths. That is deeply troubling which means that the lockdown can only be lifted with great prudence. I fully understand how important it is for businesses to be able to function. But if you can't run your factory with a certain amount of serious distancing, uh, you're going to be stuck with a lot of medical bills. If you can't keep an office physically open without people breathing into each other's uh, faces, then you will really not be able to prevent uh, both for your own office for your own staff and for the nation as a whole, uh, a dramatic increase in the caseload. So this is the, the challenge you're all facing. I think we will have to have a targeted lockdown. We can't shut down every office, every factory. It would be insane to do that. The economy cannot cope with that. But equally, it will have to be done with tremendous, tremendous um, uh, artificial constraints that we've never had before. Everybody meeting other people will have to be wearing a mask. Um, I, I've got some details, but I, I don't want to inflict them on you. Uh, they're, they're, they're available. You can Google them. Uh, for the number of minutes, uh, uh, for example, that it takes for these uh, these blessed droplets to actually come out, and 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 uh, um, and and affect people. In other words, um, you can actually catch an infection uh, from just talking to somebody, even while you're both wearing a mask for longer than five minutes because of the number of droplets that are likely to come out even through the mask. So there are enormous, enormous risks associated with proximity. And that's why the circumstances of work will have to be very artificial. With that said, we have to have a lot we have to lift the lockdown in every place where it's possible to lift it because otherwise uh, our economy will literally collapse. We're already hearing from um, uh, the, the um, association that deals with MSMEs uh, IMO, I think they're called on All India Manufacturers Organization, your association at IMA. Uh, and they're saying that as something in the neighborhood of uh, uh, 25 to 30 percent of all MSMEs uh, will have to close if they cannot function uh, in, 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 in the next few weeks. And if they close, uh, restarting them is going to be next to impossible. So we will need to do this. Thank you. Uh, another question uh, from one of our former presidents, Mr. Rajiv Kaul. Uh, do we really have an option other than increase our trade and inward investment and geopolitical and defense alignment with USA, Japan, South Korea, and Europe, and also continue our defense pact with Russia and reduce our imports from China? I mean, this, this is a, 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 a problematic. First of all, there is a different line occurring in the world in which we're very closely together. Uh, because I think I better, are you, can you hear me, everyone? Because I'm getting a warning that my internet connection is unstable. So I'll, I'll switch off my video. Hope you can still hear me, okay? Can you still hear me? Yeah. 
Just nod, yeah, Sanjay, I can I, see you. Yeah, it's okay if you can... Uh, if you can all hear thing. me, I'll carry on talking, yeah, but I've, I've stopped the video. Uh, and yeah, that's good. Yeah, so I, uh, the 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 uh, Russians and the Chinese are getting closer together uh, because of the fact that they both see themselves as having a certain common view of the world, a certain common view of what domestic situation uh, is necessary uh, for them to achieve their objectives. They're both running very similar sort of systems, though the Russians no longer use the term communist. Uh, there is no question that uh, they both have comparable authoritarian degrees of control over the public and over the economy, over the media. Uh, and at the same time, they both have a very aggressive uh, external policy, whether it's Russia and Ukraine and Syria, whether it's China and its own neighborhood and beyond. Uh, we're looking at two countries that are converging more and more. India still has a tremendous dependence on Russia for its equipment. Uh, as you know, as recently as last year, we completed the purchase of a major aircraft carrier from there. So we do have an awful lot uh, that we need to continue to keep links with the Russians for, for spares, for servicing of parts, for repairs, etc. We just can't suddenly um, uh, reduce our links with them. We have to maintain that connection. Equally, the Americans are, are getting quite hostile. You may know that we have had a, a rather nasty clash with the Americans over our decision to purchase an early warning radar system from the Russians, which our military has evaluated as technically uh, the best in the world, better than the American equivalent. And that's why we want to go ahead and buy it. But um, it's going to take a certain amount of give and take on the part of the Americans to accept that there are some areas where the Indians will not make them happy and other areas where we might, uh, and that in turn, we are going to keep our doors open with the Russians and the Chinese as well. Uh, that kind of thinking, which, you know, one associated with the more sophisticated American diplomatic era, uh, I'm afraid is perhaps not the kind of thinking that we would expect to see from the likes of, uh, of Mr. Trump. And that's why I say that even to answer this question, uh, what happens on the uh, first Tuesday in November in America could be pretty important and decisive. Okay, I am aware that uh, nine uh, seven forty-five is your hard stop. So let me ask. We, we can go on since there were interruptions. We can go on for another five five minutes and take another two. Okay. Minutes. The next there are two questions, uh, both uh, dealing uh, about uh, the international viewpoint, uh, your international viewpoint. Uh, one is from Mr. Sony uh, from uh, Trisur Management Association. He would like to have your views on the withdrawal of U.S. and Brazil from the WHO. And Sivasis Day says, uh, do you feel the virus will do uh, what the great world leaders have not been able to do, that is bring the world together better than before? But, you know, earlier you said that may not be possible. It doesn't look that way. Uh, let me, can everyone else hear me? Because... Uh, I hope my connection is not bad. I don't get such a yeah, signal. Yeah, we can hear you, Mr. Kuroska. Uh, I think Mr. Dr. Tharoor can't The problem is with my Sarkari connection in this. Uh, <laughs> OK, so the um, question this was, uh, I'm, I'm quickly scanning the, scanning the chat, the chat questions to see if I can spot the question you picked. Yeah, it's uh, share your view on withdrawal of US and Brazil from WHO. And will the world, the virus, uh, bring the world leaders together? Which I think you've answered before. But yeah, WHO. I mean, I, I, I have mentioned this uh, in my in my in my talk that the WHO withdrawal by the U.S. is an extremely disturbing uh, development, as far as I'm concerned, because uh, there is no question in my mind that this crisis has actually demonstrated that we need more international cooperation. The world should have got together, identified much earlier that we had this virus been able to come up with a point uh, of saying, here's what we all need to do together. Here's how we share information. Um, it, it seems to me that the, uh, the, the U US and Brazil withdrawing would actually just undermine the capacity of the global institutions that the rest of us also need. Now, I know that the objections to the WHO's, you know, even the accusation of culpability in spreading COVID-19 has been made by the US. They said, uh, WHO ignored red flags from Taiwan. 
um, underplayed the seriousness of the crisis, provided blanket clean fits to China and all of that. But the truth is that these UN organizations have been set up by member states precisely to ensure that the member states call the shots. There is no UN agency, not even the Secretary General of the United Nations, for example, who can send someone to a member state without that state's consent. So I've got it on reliable information that WHO wanted to send an independent group of experts to Wuhan in the second week of January and were denied visas. And there's nothing that you can do about that because uh, it, the same would have happened or could have happened with the US or Britain or Russia or other powerful countries. But that's the way the system has been designed to do. And I think that if anything, we should be coming together to reform these systems and say, how can we ensure greater genuine autonomy? That if we put the right people in charge of these organizations, we entrust them to make independent decisions that go beyond the national interests of any particular country. That kind of international reform, unfortunately, is, is not at the moment uh, on the cards. And this, instead of, 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 of saying that uh, we're going to withdraw, uh, uh, which is what the US has preferred to do, I think we're going to really be better off getting sitting together and renegotiating treaties and trade agreements to strengthen the autonomy of these institutions. Now, that's my view. I'm not sure that India, in any case, has, has expressed uh, anything but concern about the US withdrawal. We are currently chairing the, uh, the intergovernmental executive body of WHO, and, and Harsh Vardhanji, our minister, is there. Um, I hope that he will try and work um, even with the outgoing Americans to say, listen, we need to have your help and involvement. How can we reform this organization together as governments in a way that will encourage you to come back? That, I think, is the, is the role that we should play. Uh, I, I would honestly say that, uh, that uh, if, if, if every country starts putting their sovereignty and their uh, individual interests ahead of multilateralism, then the entire edifice we have constructed since 1945 of international cooperation, which stands to benefit us all, uh, will collapse. And then I think we'll be completely back in a sort of law of the jungle, uh, which is frankly what led to the horrors of the first half of the 20th century, when we had two world wars, countless civil wars, uh, massive human rights violations, the horrors of the Holocaust and Hiroshima. That was the world that was sought to be prevented in future by the setting up of the international system in 1945. Do we want to throw that away? I, I certainly hope not. But Trump doesn't have either the intelligence or the vision to understand the importance of this for the rest of us. We have to collectively educate uh, uh, the American administration. We have to, of course, hope it's a different administration in, from November onwards, but it may not be. OK. One since last question, can, perhaps, Sanjay? Since you can see the last two questions, the next question, I will, I'll repeat that. And I will end with another question. There are two questions. They talk about the same thing. So Mr. Ramesh Jali says, is this another political speech running down the government while much of the work, much of the muck raised is a carry forward from previous regimes? While uh, Mr. Pradeep Marwa, which is the last question on the list, says, I sincerely hope that all politicians will come together in matters of life and death. Any response to that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly, let, let me stress that um, uh, we are in an invidious position as opposition politicians. We have done our bit. In fact, uh, in my own case, I've been criticized by some members of my own party for having put my political differences with the state government of Kerala aside uh, to help them in multiple ways by bringing in uh, equipment, goods, resources, initially out of MP funds, and when those were canceled by the government, uh, managed to bring in, uh, managed to, to bring in um, other donations and, and, and assistance. Uh, and I praise the Kerala model for the way in which it was actually effectively dealing with this. And this is not appreciated because what happens in our country's politics is this. If you try and ignore your uh, opposition responsibilities to put your shoulder to the wheel, immediately the cry goes up, what a weak opposition, where is the opposition? They're absent at the switch, uh, they're giving the government a free field day, et cetera. And when you point out the legitimate mistakes of the government, I mean, the migrant workers crisis is, is, is essentially solely a re uh, a, a, a consequence of the prime minister's style of functioning, which no previous prime minister had. You've never had a, a prime minister in the past who twice has shocked the nation with, uh, with a dramatic announcement at two, three hours notice, the demonetization announcement, and now this one, where there was no time for anyone to plan. 
So had, for example, uh, another prime minister, let me not uh, be more uh, invidious than that, uh, said, okay, in four days time, we're going to lock down, shut down flights, trains, uh, highways, and so on. People could have had time to make alternative arrangements, to go or not go, to make arrangements to stay and to be fed, all of these things. Nobody had time, and that's why this crisis arose. Now, how can we not criticize that? So to be accused by some of, of playing politics on matters of life and death, then I would say, what about the life and death of the migrants? Uh, should they not have deserved our compassion and our help? And should we not point out to the government and shame them into extending some of this help? Some of this help. So this is the thing, it's, it's a thankless task in any democracy. Um, uh, every country has actually seen uh, variations of this debate. So I'm not, uh, I'm not embarrassed to be accused of having made political criticisms, but the specific criticisms I made cannot be ascribed to any previous government. They're about either acts of commission or omission by this government alone at this time. I'm not saying that had we been in power, we would necessarily have been perfect, but then certainly, we would have had the BJP criticizing us. That's the way it always works. Yeah, that's, that's the way a democracy works. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tharoor, for being with us this evening. Uh, almost you. There are many questions. In fact, you know, just on this chat, I can see that there are 309 participants. But uh, Rekha tells me there are over 41,000 logged on Twitter and Facebook and other social media. You, as usual, continue to be as popular as you have always been. Thank you Thank so you. much for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, we really appreciate uh, your presence uh, on this uh, webinar. Thank you, and I'm going to call the speaker now, so all the best. Thanks very much, Rekha, and have a good rest of your evening. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Rekha, would you like to end this, or uh, have I done your job? <laughs> You have, but let me add my thanks to yours. Thank you, Dr. Tharoor, for once again joining us on the IMA platform. I hope uh, we'll have you have the pleasure of having you with us uh, for future events also. Uh, thank you very much. And for the delegates, our next uh, leader speak uh, session is on the 18th of uh, June with uh, Mr. Claude Smarchta. So look forward to having you with us again. Thank, thank you, you. Rekha. Bye-bye. Yeah.